whole festivities begin. Um, last year, we had a big turnout and everybody, nobody complained that it was on Super Bowl Sunday. So we said, let's just pick the same day. Um, I am a volunteer with Loudoun Wildlife Conservancy as the, um, the um, Bluebird Monitoring Program County Coordinator. I um, coordinate the, um, the trails uh, from Loudoun County along with Joanne Davis, my trusty assistant who has picked up a lot of slack lately when I have been working and not working and going back to work and everything else has just been crazy with COVID as everybody knows. So um, thank you, Joanne, for everything you've done and continue to do. And um, I'll just start off with our presentation. This is for, I have a feeling we probably have a lot of existing monitors on here right now, which is good. Uh, because we always need a refresher. Uh, this is also considered like a little bit of training on how to monitor the boxes and what we do with the data and so forth. And um, if you're new, if you don't know anything about bluebirds, you're gonna learn something about bluebirds today. And you may be interested in signing up to monitor uh, a trail or help monitor a trail. Um, so with that, I'll get started um, with the PowerPoint. Um, I just added this, the. Uh, a small section from a very, very long poem by Henry David Thoreau. The bluebird had come from the distant south to his box in the poplar tree, and he opened his he opened wide his slender mouth on purpose to sing to me. And we're going to hear what a bluebird how the bluebird song sounds in just a little bit. So um, let's get started. If my um, okay, <laughs> here we go. Um, the Loudoun Wildlife Conservancy is in partnership with the Virginia Bluebird Society. And in case you missed it, we have um, Valerie Kenyon Gaffney, who is the, um, the BBS, Virginia Bluebird Society president. She's on with us. So I told her if I mess up, she's going to pop in and correct me. If, she, if she, you have any questions that I can't answer, I'm sure she will be more than qualified to answer. Um, so Virginia Bluebird Society began in 1996. And we have trails and county coordinators throughout the whole state of Virginia. And I am the Loudoun Wildlife Conservancy Bluebird Monitoring Coordinator. I'm also the Loudoun County Coordinator for BBS. So at the end of each um, nesting season, which is around September, we provide Loudoun County's data to BBS. And then they use that information to track population trends on our cavity nesters. And you will hear me use that term throughout this cavity nesters. It's not just about bluebirds. Uh, of course, with the Virginia Bluebird Society, we are concentrating on bluebirds. That's what they track. But um, as I'll explain later, we, we welcome all cavity nesters to our nest boxes. Okay, so some of you have seen this before. And I forget, uh, um, forgive me, but uh, some people have never seen a bluebird. So some people think this is a bluebird and it is a blue bird, but it's not a bluebird. It's a blue jay. And as you probably know, they are very vocal at your bird feeders and um, they're actually a relative of the crow. This is a pretty blue bird, but it's not a blue bird. It is an indigo bunting. And we have these around here in the summer. A lot of people have never seen them. They're gorgeous birds and they have a very pretty song and they like to sit way up at the tippy top of trees and just sing as loud as they possibly can. They're adorable. Um, this is one that's a little less seen around here. It's blue, but it's not a bluebird. It's called a blue gross beak. And it's actually related to the cardinal. I don't think I've actually ever seen one of these in person, but they are here in the summertime. So this is a bluebird. You've probably seen them and didn't even realize what you were seeing. Some people say they've never seen a bluebird and I guess I believe them, but maybe they're just not looking for them because they're definitely around here. Um, these are um, Eastern bluebirds. They're related to the robins. They're in the thrush family. And if you look, you can tell that they're kind of uh, sort of same robin shape with the same color breast, same uh, beak shape. They're a little bit smaller than robins though. Okay, somebody just asked, do you welcome English sparrows as a, as a cavity nester? No, 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 no. <laughs> and I'll talk about that in a little bit. They are not native and they're a huge problem. So James, I will address your question a little bit, um, a little bit later on in the, in the program. 
So the Eastern Bluebird, I'm covering everything up here on my screen. The Eastern Bluebird is, um, is the one that's found in Virginia. It lives across the East and the Midwest and they stay here all year long. So I hear a lot of people saying, um, I, all of a sudden I'm seeing bluebirds and I've never seen them before, or they see them all year and then they don't see them all winter. So they think that they, they migrate. Well, some of them do migrate a little bit to us. We're South, believe it or not, um, uh, relative to others, other areas, but they are in this area all year long. The Western bluebird, um, and the mountain bluebirds are in the Western portion of North America. So speaking of us being South, you can see here in the pink in Virginia where, where they are permanent resident and up North where they're breeding in the summertime, those are the birds that come down to migrate to us. Okay, so it's it. We always say, you know, birds fly south for the winter, and it's we have to remember that we are south for some birds. So um, that's their range map right there. But they are definitely permanent residents. Everywhere you see the pink, there, they are permanent residents. Okay, so the way to identify an eastern bluebird, obviously, you're going to see a lot of blue if it's a male, especially. Um, they carry the they carry the sky on their back is another quote uh, from another uh, poet. I can't remember who said that, but anyway, there's a, a poem about that. It says the bluebird carries the sky on his back. So it, sometimes you'll see him fly by and you see like a flash of blue, and that is a bluebird. So the male is going to be bright blue on the back. He's got red on his chest, just like his cousin the robin, and he's got white on the belly. The female is, as in most bird breeds um, a lot duller in color. Uh, she can still be kind of bright blue. It's sometimes I have a hard time telling them apart, but generally she's gonna be just duller in color. And the baby bluebirds are spotted. They have a spotted chest. So they're just super adorable when they, when they come out, they're beautiful. So how does a bluebird sound? What is the bluebird song? This is what a bluebird sounds like. They're very gentle birds. They have a nice little throaty um, warbling sound. And once you tune into that, you will definitely recognize them. Sitting on your back porch in your own neighborhood, you'll say, oh, that's a bluebird. So that's what a bluebird sounds like. Oh gosh, what have I done? Here we go, hold on. Okay, where do bluebirds live? They live in parks. They live on golf courses. They live on farms, cemeteries, schools, suburbs, and wineries. Now, what do all of these places have in common? If you look at them, they have open areas and scattered trees. It's not the forest. It's not um, open farmland. It's places with a combination of, of both open spaces and trees because they need they need the grassland to um, to search for their food for their um, insects and of course the trees to live in and provide shelter. So there are also uh, trees called snags. Those are trees that have broken off. And you can see the one there on the left is a tree in my yard that broke off during that weird tornado that we had <laughs> like a year or two ago. Um, and I just left it. And I'm glad I did because just about a month later, if you look at the photo all the way on the right, there was the start of a, um, of a woodpecker hole there. Now this is an older picture that I don't know where it came from, but there's some very definite holes there. So. If, if it's possible that a tree, a tree breaks off and it's not in danger of falling on any human or structure, just leave it because it is nature's condominiums and cafeterias, as the slide says. So there's a woodpecker. Woodpeckers are called primary cavity nesters. 
And bluebirds are called secondary cavity nesters because obviously um, bluebirds don't have the, the long beak and the, the brain protection that, that woodpeckers have to, to uh, peck their own holes. So they go and they use holes that are already made. Whoops, sorry. So tree cavities do make the best habitat because that's all natural, but there are not enough. So we help and we have our man-made cavities, which is what we call the bluebird box or nest box. So when you monitor a bluebird trail or help monitor, I should say, because it's, we try not to have just one person doing a trail. We like to have at least four. Um, you're gonna witness the whole life cycle of a bluebird and it's very exciting to see. Um, the first thing they do in February, like around now, and I've seen this in my bluebird box in my backyard, uh, the male is, is real estate shopping. He's, um, he's trying to select a nest site and he sings to attract the females and warn away other males. Now this says each bluebird pair needs about two to three and a half acres. I, I don't, I have not verified that. I don't actually know if that's true, but I have two in my, in my yard, which is, I mean, I have a five acre lot, but it's um, it, not the whole thing is cleared. So I've got like an acre in the back and an acre in the front. So it, I think it's more important about where, how you space them because on obviously on, um, on trails, they're not spaced that far apart, so. It's a good rule of thumb anyway, I guess. So in March, they start their courtship. The female starts to respond to the male's song and territory, and he tries to um, take her out for some nice dinners of worms. It's always exciting. And then in late March, the female is gonna start making the nest. Um, the male does the shopping, the female decides on where to build the nest, okay? So she takes about five to 10 days to build the nest and their nests are very soft um, grasses and pine needles. They're, they're very neat, very neat organized nests, very tightly woven. Well, you can see it right here, how, it, how they look. Um, the female is gonna lay a clutch of one egg a day for three to six days. And of course you can see the eggs are blue. They're very small. And I have actually had white bluebird eggs in my nest. I don't know if that's my picture, but it's somebody's and those are actually white eggs. So, um, so it's sometimes confused with um, tree swallow eggs. So you need to be careful when you're identifying those on the trail. And if you ever have any questions, you can snap a picture and email it to somebody, you can email it to me, anybody who would know, put it on our Facebook page. Um, it's very easy to take pictures of bluebird eggs because uh, from with the phone because you can just put your phone camera right up to the hole and snap a picture. You don't need to um, be intrusive at all. So here she is incubating her eggs. She sits on them for about two weeks and she only leaves for short periods of time she begins incubating all the eggs at the same time so that all the chicks will hatch and fledge together. Then after a few weeks, the eggs start to hatch and you can see that one right there. That's called pipping. When they start to pip, you know they're gonna come out and then they're just gonna start, they're just gonna follow one after the other. Sometimes more than one a day, sometimes one a day and if you've never seen them before, when they first come out of the egg, it's a little shocking. They look kind of like little alien creatures, but I think they're absolutely adorable with their little stringy hairs. But um, this is a picture on the right that I took of a, a newborn, <laughs> I call it, that's um, resting on his its siblings, uh, just resting on his e siblings' eggs. I just think it's so cute. Okay. So you get to watch the whole life cycle. We count the day of hatch as day zero. And then you can see how they grow. They start maybe by day, maybe by day five, six, seven, really to look like real birds. Um, 
And then by day 15 or 16, they're actually ready to fledge. Sometimes sooner than that, sometimes later than that. So not this is nature. We don't have any control over when they do things. It's going to depend on the weather and, and all kinds of things. But generally average 15, 16 days they take to grow. And uh, mom and dad bring the food to the nest constantly. I think there's a slide on that. So um, we did see this slide here. Uh, just went, there we go, of a person holding uh, the baby chicks. We don't do that. We, we do not do that unless you're a licensed bird bander. Um, and we have no reason to do it. We're not banding them. We're just counting them. We're making sure they're healthy, you know, without doing an examination or anything, but we're making sure they're healthy and, um, and monitoring their growth. So just remember that we don't touch the birds. I'm trying to get this out of the way. There we go. Okay, so feeding them, uh, the parents feed the chicks constantly, constantly, five times per hour each day. When you think about that, that's like between 10 and 15 minutes a day or an hour. And that is absolutely true. I've sat on my back deck and just watched watch the parents come in with food, 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 food all day long. And it's a lot of fun to watch them feeding. And a lot of people wonder how they keep the nest clean. Well, the birds, not just bluebirds, but a lot of uh, uh, probably most, if not all cavity nesters, they carry away the fecal sacs with the chick's waste, which I think is really cool. So when it's time to fly, they're 16 to 20 days old and they do not return to the nest. That's another myth that the baby will leave the nest and then they come back like it's their house, but it's really not their house. It's just the, the boxes and a nest of birds generally are only used for reproducing, for raising a brood. Um, they don't like live in them. They will use the nests in the, the boxes and nests if it's still in there in the winter uh, for warmth, but it's just not like where they live. It's not like a chicken coop or anything. Um, so they don't return to the nest. Um, we also do not open the box uh, and after they're 12 days old because they can get spooked and fly out prematurely and that would not be good. And then the juveniles will stay with the parents for the whole season. And here's some little babies that flew out of my backyard box to a nearby tree. You can see all the speckles on them, the little babies, they're so cute. And there they are, they sort of blend in for camouflage. And they're actually about the same size as the adults, which again is um, very common with most bird species, except for a lot of waterfowl, where you'll see the um, little babies or you know, just tiny babies. <laughs> um, baby birds, once they fledge, are almost always the same size as the parents. So that's another sort of uh, mis or myth or whatever that people think because a bird is small, it must be a baby, but that's not necessarily true. So <clears throat> for the next six weeks or so, the parents are gonna teach the chicks how to hunt for their own food. Some of the chicks get, get a little lazy and just want mom and dad to keep feeding them but that's okay, they still do, they're very good parents. And a bluebird can raise two or three families each year. That's about usually what I get in my backyard, two or three, I think I've had four before, but that's kind of unusual. So once the chicks have fledged, um, you as a monitor clean out the nest box and then the female will start a new nest and start all over again. And like I said before, the nest box do help in the winter time it helps them keep warm. They all huddle together. I think, how many are in here? One, two, three, four, five, six. There's like at least nine or 10 birds in that box. So that's, I've never witnessed that, but it's kind of fun to see. So bluebirds, like I said earlier, are not just, or bluebird nest boxes are not just for bluebirds. We allow other cavity, native cavity nesters to use our bluebird boxes. And I just want to point out um, that all native birds are protected by federal law. They can use and cannot be evicted from nest boxes. Now, a house sparrow, as someone asked, that, or a European sparrow, I believe he called it, English sparrow, European sparrow, whatever you want to call it. We generally just call them house sparrows. 
they are not native birds. They were introduced, uh, I have more on this later, they were introduced here and they compete with our bluebirds for food and um, habitat. So we do not let them stay in the boxes. We remove their nests, we remove their eggs, and we remove their young if we have to. And it's not always an easy thing to do because they are living things and you just have to do what you have to do. And if you can't, then you just don't. <laughs> We've actually accidentally left um, a, um, a house sparrow nest uh, continue on because it was mislabeled. And then we were, we, then we didn't open the box because we thought there were bluebirds in there. And then it turns out there were house sparrows and you know, you shed a couple tears and then you move on with your life. So anyway, trees, tree swallows are native birds and they lay little teeny, teeny, tiny white eggs in a big bowl of feathers. And it just looks like something you just wanna dive right into. It looks so soft and pretty and comfy. Um, and their eggs are actually a little bit smaller than bluebird eggs. And they're point, generally pointier. You can see that these have a little bit more of a point on them. So they're, they're a little bit hard to distinguish from bluebird eggs, especially if your bluebird eggs are white, um, but they are pretty distinctive and they usually lay a, a good amount, like six or seven. So, um, and the feathers actually is the, is the giveaway that that's a, a tree swallow. Um, I can never remember the name of this bird. Tufted titmouse <laughs> uh, is another cavity nester, a native bird. This on the left is a Carolina chickadee. And I believe that's also a Carolina chickadee down there feeding her young. Um, those are also native birds and they're also um, cavity nesters. So we do allow them to, to stay in our nest boxes. And we've had a few, Oatlands last year had a nest of uh, titmouse, I think. So that was really exciting. I, I actually get excited when we have other native cavity, cavity nesters in there in addition to bluebirds, because it just shows that we're providing, you know, a good thing. House wrens are also native birds. Now, a lot of people don't like house wrens because they can be a little mean, but they are native birds and we welcome them to our nest boxes. Um, they construct a nest out of sticks. And when I say sticks, I mean floor to ceiling sticks. Like you can't even open the box if there's a full nest in there from a house run. It's crazy. And most of the time you just have to guess how many eggs are in there because you just can't open. You can't take a picture. Um, I have been known to put my finger in and count with my fingers and just hope that there's like not a snake or something in there. But I don't actually recommend doing that because you could break an egg or something. But if you got to know, that's what you do. But um, generally they lay a lot of eggs too, five to eight. And they also like brushy areas. So if your box is in an area that's backed up by a lot of brush bushes and high grasses and everything, there's a good chance that you'll get house wrens in there. So they're not a bad thing. Don't, uh, don't think they're a bad thing. So why did the bluebird population decline? Why are we doing this? <laughs> That's another question I get a lot. Um, so during colonial times, the bluebird was as common as the American robin. And you know how common they are. Sometimes we see hundreds at a time. Um, in the 1850s, the house sparrow, the English sparrow, whatever you want to call it, was introduced from England. And um, in 1872, the Cincinnati Acclimatization Society released 4,000 European songbirds as an experiment. And I think we now know that was an experiment gone horribly wrong. Took them five years to debate the value of non-native species. And during all that time of debate, um, the bluebird population declined to almost extinction in the 1970s. So why did they bring the birds here besides just wanting to experiment? Um, the immigrants wanted their familiar songbirds around them. I guess the, uh, let's see, the, the um, experiment was to aid against the encroachment of insects. I thought, I guess they thought we had too many insects and uh, to ensure the ennobling influence of the song of birds will be felt by the inhabitants. That's just the, the um, that's just the immigrants wanting their native songbirds 
with them, what they're what they were accustomed to. So, so the bluebird population depends on a lot of things: weather, predators, availability of food, competition for nest sites, and environmental controls. Anytime there's development, we're destroying natural habitat and bluebirds lose the open area they need for nesting and feeding. There seems to be a little bit of a, um, over, over the past, I guess, 20 years or so, there's been a little bit of a shift in development uh, to leave more open areas, which I guess is a good thing if you gotta build a house, you gotta build a development, leave some open areas. Uh, trees were clear cut for farming. So woodpeckers and bluebirds adapted to using fence posts. That's not good. Before I go on to how they feed, let me let's see if, what our questions are. No English pairs. Should I clean out my bluebird houses now? Yes, that would be a good idea. Um, they still might use it for huddling together, but since they're, they're shopping for, for a house right now, clean it out now. And that way you'll be all ready for whenever they decide. Sometimes they start building a nest in March, sometimes April. It could be the end of February. We don't, you know, if we get a warm spell, they might get a little confused and start building a nest. So yeah, if you have a bluebird house with a nest in it, clean it out. You should clean it out at the end of the season, ideally. So bluebirds feed uh, by gathering insects from the leaves, branches, and the ground. That's why they need the trees and the open area. And they also catch insects in the air, which is called hawking or off the wing. And in the winter time, they rely on berries. So that's why it's important to plant native plants, like um, things that give us berries, like the dogwood. Um, oh, there's a list in here. I can't remember them. Um, herbicides and pesticides, obviously not good. Uh, they pollute the drinking water. They interrupt the food chain. They poison the insects. The insects are eaten by the birds, the birds get sick, and it's like the little old lady who swallowed the fly, and it's just not good for anybody. So limit the use of herbicides and pesticides. Um, it's, it's, it's all good to leave it all natural. We, we don't need to kill every, everything that's, that's growing in our yards without other than lawn. So anyway, um, let's talk about the house sparrow. This on the left is a house sparrow, that's a male. He's, um, it's actually kind of a pretty bird. It's very pretty bird when you're in Europe, <laughs> but when you're in the U.S., they're they're we don't like them. I don't like them. Um, we do get rid of them. We we take out their nests. We take out their eggs. We will take out their young if we if we miss the eggs. So um, if you need advice on that, um, just contact me, and we'll try to figure out what to do if you have a hard time. Uh, getting rid of uh, any young uh, eggs are easy. They eggs in the nest. You can just wrap them up in a plastic bag and put it in the trash. But if they've hatched, it, it's a little. It's a little bit of a moral. Well, not a little bit for me. It's a very big moral dilemma on what to do. So it depends on how adamant you are. And um, oops, sorry about that. Uh, anyway, and the European starling was also an introduced species. Again a beautiful bird. It's got little stars all over its back. It's beautiful, but they're big bullies. They're going to eat all your food at the bird feeder. They're going to attack birds or bluebirds. They're just not nice. They, they're very aggressive, both of these species. And they will chase away and kill bluebirds. They do peck at the chicks and the adults and they will kill them. And if it was a native bird doing that, we let it go. It's a non-native bird, so we're free to get rid of them however we see fit. And I've actually witnessed this. Um, house sparrows will actually weave the remains of bluebirds into their nests. I, I saw this last year and it's very, very sad. Very sad. So how do you participate in bluebird monitoring? We have plenty of public trails, um, something like 45 more or less public trails that we always need monitors for, some more than others. You can start your own home trail and that just means that you provide your own box and equipment and you install it and you monitor it and then you 
relay the data at the end of the year. I'll send you a form and your totals will be counted in, in our county totals. It's very, very rewarding to do a home trail because you can go out and monitor it uh, at, at your convenience, no more obviously than once a week. And we also always need help with trail maintenance on installing boxes and baffles and uh, rehabbing boxes. They, they have a, a not an infinite lifespan. They rot, they come apart and so forth. Uh, so we always need um, we always need volunteers for all these things. Uh, the committees, uh, the next nest box rehabs, uh, scouts are always looking for projects, which is a great thing. Just if you have a scout or know of a scout that wants to build boxes or start a trail or whatever, please have them contact me or um, or Virginia Bluebird Society first because we have very specific. Um, uh, protocol on how the boxes are to be built and we don't want somebody throwing something up and calling it a day and then the boxes just fall apart because they're not built correctly. I actually experienced a trail where <laughs> nothing against Boy Scouts but it was uh, boxes built by Boy Scouts that we could not figure out how to open any of the boxes. They were all screwed shut in every single spot. So that was that was a little disheartening. Um, HOA outreach is a big thing. Uh, a lot of HOAs um, can get involved in having their, their uh, residents monitor and, and maintain the trails. And we always need help with GPS mapping. I don't know how to do that yet, but... Um, we like to have a map of every trail so that if a, you send a new monitor out, they can have something to follow so they can find it. So um, there's a couple of things you have to remember when you set up a trail. You can see this one is on a pole and that's or a, a fence post and that one's not good. The one down here in the bottom right hand corner is good. Um, you're gonna look for the nice habitat. They live in open areas of scattered trees, as we talked about. And it's also a good idea to get permission because you're gonna be walking on somebody's property. If it's not your own, you're gonna be installing boxes that they may not want. <laughs> so please get permission to install and monitor. Make sure they know that it's going to be monitored by you and possibly up to four or more other people once a week, okay, through, um, uh, March or April through the end of August and sometimes into September. So always good to get permission. Um, pay, face box opening away from prevailing wind and towards a tree or shrub within a hundred feet. I don't know about the wind, my, the wind where I am goes every which way, I don't know. But a tree or shrub within a hundred feet, the reason for that is they, the babies need a place to fledge to. We don't want to put a box out in the middle of a golf course and then they just fly out and and plop down to the ground. So did somebody have was gonna say something or did I okay, sorry. Okay, so what makes a good bluebird nest box? A wood box, a floor space of four by four, entrance hole of one and a half inches diameter. Sounds really small. It's the size of a golf ball, more or less, just pretty much the size of a golf ball. So if you can picture that, no purchase. This is not um, the boxes you're gonna buy in an antique store you know, made out of a teapot or whatever. These are very specific specifications. The floor needs to allow drainage. The roof needs to allow ventilation and you need to be able to get it open. <laughs> and most of these are built with a, a little ladder Inside, it's not really a ladder. It's just like little pieces of wood so that they have something, the babies have something to hold on to when they, they look out. When they start to get a little older, it's just super adorable. They, um, they get curious about the outside world. So they hang on and, and look out the, the hole and see what's going on out there with the big world that they're about to go into. So that's kind of cool. Um, this, I don't know if it's, it might be a little hard to see, a piece of mesh wire here, a wire mesh is called a Noel guard. It's gonna keep raccoons and cats and other mammals out. And there is a specific way that those need to be installed too. And I see it installed wrong every, every like literally everywhere. Um, we have these at Loudon Wildlife 
if you need them for your trail, they, they're just flat, but they're cut properly. They just need to be folded and installed. A lot of people install them so that the outside is smooth, is smooth so you don't hurt your hand when you reach in there, but the idea is to hurt whatever wants to go in there. So we wanna install that to where the, um, I don't even know how to say this, to where the points are out. Like it's pointy and sharp and stickery, stickily and it's not pleasant, <laughs> but that's the whole point of it. So if you have any questions on how to install those, just let me know. Um, the snake guard, also known as a baffle, very, very important. This is gonna keep snakes from climbing up the pole. Okay, um, please don't install a nest box if you're not going to at least install a baffle. Um, the Noel guard is optional. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of them. I don't, I just haven't seen any difference with them or without them, um, but they're there. They're an extra precaution, but the baffle, in my opinion, is the most important thing because it's gonna keep things from climbing up into your box. Okay, and please don't put it on a, uh, a fence post or telephone pole or any kind of pole. Put it on a metal pole with the baffle. And the reason is these guys. Okay, this snake just slithered right on up into this box, grabbed lunch and left. This raccoon is gonna take that paw and stick it right in the hole. I actually had that happen once. That was not a pleasant surprise um, to find on Mother's Day morning when all my babies were gone. Um, and cats, cats are, I'm a huge cat lover. I have never not had a cat in my life and I have two cats right now and I love cats. They have always been 100% indoor cats. If you have cats, please keep them inside. If you have outdoor cats, please don't put up a, a, <laughs> a lunchbox for them unless you have the proper precautions because they're they are not native. Cats are not native uh, and they destroy wildlife. It's just a fact. So those are things we're protecting, protecting against. And this is what I mean by lunchbox. Anything can just pop right in there and just take whatever it wants, however big or small it is. If it's big, it's gonna reach in and grab eggs, grab babies, grab adults. It's just not good. So when you're monitoring the bluebirds, uh, some people think that you're disturbing them. And the truth is you're not. Um, if, the, if, the, if mom or dad are in the box, and they don't want to leave, don't, don't open the box. I mean, we don't want to scare them or freak them out. But most of the time, once you walk around the box, you're just going to tap on the side. They're going to fly out, okay? Um, they're very tolerant of careful monitoring. There's really not a whole lot to worry about. So we check the boxes every week during nesting season, March through August, and we keep records. We, heal, we deal with concerns. Some concerns are insects and um, uh, predators and our house sparrows. Please do not install a box unless it's gonna be monitored. Okay, so some of the things that we deal with, and honestly, this is just so rare. I think I've been doing this for like, I don't know, three or four years maybe. And I've only had, I've had a couple of instances with ants but that's pretty, they're pretty easy to control if you put Vaseline on the pole underneath of the baffle, that way they can't crawl up. We did have a trail at Wild and Water that had a huge ant problem that we couldn't get rid of. And we don't, we just, uh, we just gave up on that box because there's nothing we could do about it. Um, occasionally you'll get a wasp at the, um, on the roof or the ceiling, I should say, excuse me on the ceiling of um, the box. If you go early in the morning, or actually, I'm sorry, at early in the evening, like around seven, eight o'clock at night, you the wasps are usually very quiet. You can just, if there's none in there, you can just scrape off their nest and throw it away. It's not a big deal. Luckily, because this picture is really gross, I have never had to deal with blowfly larvae. <laughs> 
I, I don't, I have never experienced that. So um, thankfully, I don't know what the remedy is for that. There's no, uh, it just says check for it. I'll have to research what the remedy is for that. But luckily, knock on wood, I haven't had to deal with that. So again, don't put up a nest if it's not going to be monitored. Why? Because it'll be a house sparrow hotel. And the last thing we want to do is perpetuate house sparrows. It's one thing that they're here and we got to live with them. It is what it is. But it, the more we can prevent, the lower their numbers will be. So if you don't feed house sparrows, um, no, I shouldn't. it's really not true. They're everywhere. <laughs> I monitor at um, Zephaniah Vineyard and they don't feed the house sparrows. Nobody, there's no food around for house sparrows to eat. There's really not even any trash around. House sparrows build really trashy nests like with plastic bags and gum wrappers and cigarette butts. There's none of that around there. It's a, it's a vineyard, it's out in the country. But there's house sparrows. Every year we have lots and lots of house sparrows and we just really keep on top of it. But I guess the thing is don't do anything that would attract them. Okay, so when we monitor, we monitor weekly, individually or through the team. Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry, my nose is all itchy today. Um, ideally we'll have maybe four people on a team, that would be good. So everybody monitors once a month or so, depending on how many weekends are in the year, in the month. Uh, more is better if you don't wanna monitor that often. We check each box, we stand to the side, we tap on the box and we open it slowly, but we don't hang around all afternoon. We open it, we observe what's in the box. Uh, if they're building a nest, the number of eggs, the number of babies. If it's, um, if it's a house sparrow nest, we just remove that. So observe quickly and then close the box. And then I usually just move on in between that and the next box to write down everything, to record my data, the date, the species, my observations. When the babies have fledged, we clean out the box. And this is a very good tip to stand upwind because there's a lot of dust in there and you don't want that all in your face. Um, dispose of the old nest in the garbage. And then uh, we compile the data at the end of the season onto a trail summary form, which I'm gonna show you. And it's nice to email your trail teammates every week uh, so that they're not surprised when they open the book and say, Oh, there were, oh no, there were ants in here last week, but they, you know, they might already know, you know, if you send them an email, they'll already, oh, this one had ants. So I'm going to pay special attention to that one when I go monitor the next week. And then all of our data is due to VBS on the 15th of September. Some of the things that we keep in our trail monitoring bag of tricks is a notebook. It's usually a binder that barely fits in a bucket, but we try. Uh, pen or pencil, preferably more than one because when you drop it on the trail, you'll never find it. A screwdriver because a lot of boxes unscrew. Some of them just have a nail in them like this. This one, the nail is gonna pull out to the right and then this section on the left is gonna lift up. So um, a mirror, if you, um, I actually just sort of substitute my, my phone for a mirror. If I can't see something, I just, I just blindly will take a picture of it and then I enlarge it and I'm like, oh, that's what that is. Um, but if you don't want to do that, you can carry a mirror, like a little round, uh, kind of like a dental mirror, only bigger. Uh, flashlight always helps. I actually have never used one, but um, if you can't, if you can't see you, in the box, you'll need a flashlight. You'll need to have a supply of grocery bags or some kind of trash bags. Gloves are always handy because you're gonna be handling nests and possibly eggs and possibly, I hate to say this, dead birds, but it happens. Uh, some kind of spatula, toothbrush, paintbrush, putty knife to, um, to scrape out all the dust and stuff from the bottom of the, the box when you remove the nest. Uh, duct tape. I always wondered why, why would we carry duct tape? Well, sometimes baffles get uh, smashed from lawnmowers. It's a good way to repair them. Sometimes uh, the roof of a 
nest box will start to rot or start to come off, come unhinged or whatever. And we can't replace the box because there's a nest of babies in there. You can, you can just wrap up to duct tape around that, it fixes everything. Uh, Vaseline, you don't need a giant thing, just a, a, one of the little ones it will probably be sufficient for one season. And that's for the pole if you have ants. And just for your own personal protection, like off or something, um, because you're, you're gonna be walking through fields. Some are mowed, some are not, some are ticky, some are not, so. Okay, so you wanna to listen to weather reports before going out. You don't wanna head out and then have a thunderstorm come crashing down on you because that would not be pleasant for you. And we don't normally monitor in, in the rain just to keep the birds happy. Uh, watch out for poison ivy, poison oak, etc. Check yourself for ticks every time. Um, so wasps are cold and slow in the morning. Actually, I said evening. Oh, hold on. Oh my goodness. Um, I gotta stop clicking. <laughs> Um, this says they're cold and slow in the morning. So I, I correct, uh, stand corrected on the evening uh, comment. Uh, that's the best time to evict them. And watch for dive bombing tree swallows. When you're monitoring a nest of tree swallows, they, they're not happy. <laughs> I don't think they'd hurt you, but man, they, they dive bomb you. They really don't like you around their nest. So that's why we do it quickly. Open, observe, close, move on and then write your data. Okay, so this sort of just reiterates what I said, open the box only once a week, spend as little time, avoid monitoring on cold rainy days. If the female does not leave the nest when you open the box, you can try to peek under her, but use your judgment. I, I've been known to, to put, my, put my fingers under a, a, a mama bird just to see what's going on under there. But then I used to have chickens too, so I was used to doing that. Um, Monitoring with kids is a really good activity. It's a good family activity, but just make sure they understand that, you know, it's not a playground. It's not, um, you know, it's, it's science, number one. So they understand um, that, that they're doing something important, not just playing, and that they need to be quiet and gentle so they don't scare the birds away. So here's an example of a form that we fill out. This is what's in the binder that we're gonna look at every week. And we're gonna record the date and um, what the situation with the boxes. Is it empty? Do we have a partial nest? Do we have a complete nest? And usually when it's partial, you can identify what it is. If you can't, you just leave a blank, blank. you put a question mark. You can write possibly bluebird. Uh, sometimes in the beginning stages, bluebird and tree swallow nest are difficult to uh, discern. Actually, even house sparrow nests, sometimes at the very beginning, you're not sure what they are. So we would just write on here HS question mark. And so that the next week when there's a complete nest, it's like, oh yeah, that's a house sparrow. We take it out. Or, oh yeah, it's a bluebird nest and it's got three eggs in it. Yay. So um, you can just see how we how we record everything all the way from an empty box all the way up to five babies fledging. And I suggest this um, because your trail leader at the end of the season has to compile a bunch of data, including when was the first egg? <laughs> when was the first hatch? When was the first fledge? And it really, really helps that person out if you highlight that information somehow. Put it in red, highlight it with a yellow highlighter, whatever you have to do, so that they don't have to go through 20 pages and look at every single word on the page to figure out when the first date was. So just, like I said, your trail leader will thank you if you do this. Because this is this is one of the forms that we fill out. There's the back of it too, but I didn't uh, screenshot that one. Um, but basically, um, it's the same information. It's just in a different format. But page two of this, is has um has places to put when the first hatch was when the first fledge was i i may be missing some of the information but um okay i'm going to take a half a second here and look at the questions age of young says one okay well hold on okay somebody's answered one day old yes the powerpoint presentation will be recorded and one of the loud and wildlife 
uh, people will have a link for you. All right, I'm gonna go back. Oh, we got lots and lots. Okay, we're all back, all right. Yes, clean out your, okay. Do you recommend leaving nests in place through winter for huddling and then clean it out in February? Um, I don't recommend it or not recommend it. Um, it. Generally, we do clean out the nest at the end of the season. It's gonna prevent um, parasites and other problems. They, they'll happily huddle in the nest that's, um, that's bare, that has no, uh, huddle in a box that's bare. So that's, yes, clean out your box, but it's not the end of the world if you don't. Let me tell, put it that way. Bluebirds came to our feeder yesterday. Yeah, they're really in the area. Mine are, are hanging around their box today. Yep, they are pairing off. I have seven bluebirds at my feeder this winter. They seem to be pairing off and I now have two pairs, good. Is it often the same couple who come back to raise another family? That is a very good question. I don't really know how, uh, Valerie may be able to, to chime in on this, but I don't know how we would know unless they're banded or they have some kind of special identifying feature. What I've always read is that the, the young come back to where they were born and will have their families. So I can do a little more research on that and give you a better answer, but um, I just, I don't know. What I would say, Lisa, um, yeah. so if you're talking about within the, within the season. Yes. It, well, yeah, they do this the same season, the it's season, the same parents, um, right? Yeah, it, unless something happens to male or female, mm -hmm. it would be the same couple. Okay. Um, you would pretty much assume you're correct unless they're banded, you can't tell about the following mm -hmm. year, but you're also correct when you say that very often the uh, fledglings will return to the same, if right. not the same box, because, you know, one pair, one box, but right. to the same area. Okay, very good. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Valerie. You're welcome. Um, doesn't the cage on the front around the door also serve as a perch? Do you need a cage? Um, mm, that's a good question. It won't serve as a perch for a predator bird. Okay. However, on my trail, I have seen tree swallows. Yes. Hanging out in them. Yes, tree swallows. Um, but if there's any chance at all that you're going to have a cat, a raccoon, a snake drop down from a tree above, we very, very strongly recommend the Noel guards. Okay. It's, it's not 100%, but it's, I think you mentioned it earlier, it's just, it's another precaution. Okay. Very good. How far down from the nest box should a baffle be installed? Oh my goodness. These are good questions, people. I don't know the answer. Valerie, don't go away. <laughs> <laughs> About six inches between the bottom okay. of the nest box and the top of the baffle. Okay. All right. I can answer the next one. What if the parent doesn't fly out? What should you do? Do you just move on? Like I said, I've, I've poked my fingers under mom before just to see what's going on. But really, if she's that adamant about staying, just leave her be. She doesn't want you there anyway. And she's probably scared. So we're going to, we're going to just let her, let her be. Um, it's not the end of the world. If you're, if your box, if you know, it's a bluebird in there and mom doesn't move, it's okay. If you miss a week of monitoring the, the goal of monitoring that, well, there's a lot of goals, but one goal is to keep the house sparrows away. And you would, it, you would have, known by then. Oops. Oh, I gotta stop doing this. Um, if the, if there were house sparrows in there. So, or the wasps, or the wasps are often lethargic in the cool of the morning. Another good, yeah, I, I fixed myself up there. I said morning, then I said no evening, and now I'm back to morning. So thank you for that. How clean do you need to clean out the boxes? Sometimes after removing the nest, I see remaining feces on the bottom. Do you need to wash all that out with water? Or is it okay for there to be a little residual stuff in there? Um, just whatever you can get out, you're gonna pull, the, you're gonna actually pull the nest out with your hand. And then whatever's left in there, um, 
your paintbrush is going to help. Your little putty scraper is going to get out the um, feces, and then that's good. There's we're not uh, we're not doing a car wash here, so it, it's fine. There'll be a little dust in there. It's fine to have a little bit there. And yes, most trails do, well, not most, but they all should have uh, tools and a bucket to store them. Now we have some trails where it's not feasible to have a, um, a bucket because there's no building or anything to store it, but um, you can arrange with your trail, fellow trail monitors who's got it and where to store it or whatever. And yes, we're gonna give you the recorded PowerPoint and somebody says age of young says one, what does that mean one day? Is there an app we can use and share across the team to save the others the time of having to rekey the data? Um, Pam, I think you mean like we're like writing in a book and then we're keying it in at the end of the season. Um, I'm not real up on apps but there's probably something out there. A lot of times, um, a lot of trails, I should say, are moving from the hard copy binder to just emailing the team every week. And then the trail leader will take that data at the end of the season. The only problem I found with that is that your highlights get lost. Like if I'm monitoring this week and I have the first bluebird egg, yay. And I type it and I email it to all my my monitors, but I've, I've highlighted, I've typed it in red or yellow or highlighted, whatever you do in word or whatever. By the time that gets copied and sent on to the next person the next week, that highlighted information gets lost. So the trail leader still has to file through data or, or um, yeah, lots of data to find this stuff out. So it, it's, I don't know, I've been having, I've been struggling with that myself. I, there's gotta be a better way, <laughs> but sometimes good old pen and paper is, is the answer. If you can think of anything, please, 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 please let me know. Um, if you only observe the box once a week, how do you know how old the baby is? That's a very good question. Well, you observed it last week and there were just eggs and then you observe it the following week and there's one baby. Well, that one baby is probably one day old because the other, the other eggs have not hatched. If you have six babies, the chances are pretty good that they're six days old, or at least the, the, um, the oldest one is gonna be six days old. Um, you can also tell in the binder is going to be a picture that I showed earlier with uh, the person holding all the babies at the different stages, you know, one day, two days, three days, up to 16. You, that's a really good way to estimate. And it's an estimate. It's an, is what it is. You're, you're going to know if it's one day old or um, 10 days old. You're going to know if it's between one and five. So it's, it's not an exact science. But Lisa, um, if I can interrupt here, sure, please do. Um, New, uh, North American Bluebird Society published an amazing uh, chart within the last year of aging the babies. Oh, I will send that. I will send that to you, okay. and you can share it with your folks. It's I it's will absolutely. It's amazing. It's, oh, good. Thank you. Because I right. telling how old a baby is, is like, whoa. Yeah, that's one of the hardest things. But usually, you can do it by counting backwards more so than looking at it. Yeah, because the difference between a two day old and a three day old is not that obvious. But yeah, so I usually count backwards from Oh, that egg just hatched. So it must just be one day old. But yeah, I would love to see that. Yeah, I'll um, take care of that. Thank you. On our trail, we have had white eggs in the same area across a couple of years. Is egg color environmental or is it the same couple? I would venture to say that it's the same couple because it's a genetic thing in mom that determines the egg color. So I think you're getting the same couple, which is pretty cool. How high should the box be installed on the pole? Um, I think five feet or higher is, is the norm. Um, I'm going to share at the end a website, um, actually the Virginia Bluebird Society, that has so much information on it with all these details, inches and feet and everything that is going to answer a lot of questions. 
Does Loud and Wildlife Conservancy supply the tools necessary or do we bring our own? We have a limited supply of, of supplies. <laughs> um, anything, I mean, everything's donated. So if you want to supply your own, just consider that a donation to your trail. And um, if not, we can see what we can cobble together from our, our supplies. Okay. Um, we created a Google Sheet that we share, made it easier to also input our data on our phones on the trail. That's a very good idea, Terry, um, to create a Google Sheet. Now we run into, we run into, um, how do I say this? Folks that aren't real um, computer savvy or just interested in another spreadsheet or whatever. So there's, there's always some resistance there, but if you can, um, if you can agree among your trail monitors how to do it, that's fine. We don't care. We we don't collect those individual sheets. This sheet that you're looking at right here on my screen is the is what matters at the end of the season. How you collect it throughout the season is up to you. You just have to remember that you might have a new monitor joining in the middle of the season. You might have somebody leave and you know, just keep things in mind that if you have somebody joining, are you going to be able to bring them up to speed? Whereas in a binder, they can just open it up and look, but it completely up to the trail monitors. Um, if my HOA wants to set up a monitoring program, what steps should they follow? Um, oh, let's see. They email me. <laughs> Because we need to get you on, on the records with Loud and Wildlife and uh, make sure that the boxes are um, the right specifications and how many and if, are you going to have volunteers and so forth. We do have Brambleton is, uh, has many different trails with different uh, sets of monitors. So yeah, that, that's just email me. I'll put my email on this too. Do you use DE to control insects? No. Um, can I yes. interrupt? Yes, please. Um, actually, um, we do use food grade diatomaceous earth as a deterrent for blowfly larvae. Oh, that's what you do with those. But it, it doesn't be you know, it, it has doesn't... to be food grade. And right. and you were right, Lisa. You said that you have never had blowfly larvae in any of your nests, nor have I. Okay, good. But there is a woman on our board, one of our directors who's had a real problem with it. Hmm. And I recommend it to my trails here in Prince William County as sort of a preventive measure. Um, and there is a way to puff it into the box, but you have to do it after the first egg is laid, but before they hatch. Okay. So if anyone is interested, there are very clear and specific instructions on the Virginia Bluebird Society oh, book, okay. right, on how to use the food grade. It's food got grade, to be yes. food grade. And you, right, right. you used to have chickens, so you're familiar yes, with- I'm very familiar with it. I even grade. have some. <laughs> Yeah. But I thought that it killed all insects, which is why we wouldn't use it. But I understand now if you're just putting it in the box, they you just all you're doing is treating the blowfly larvae because they okay. put it, you know, on their echoskeleton and yeah, they die. But no, yeah, we, yeah okay. we don't want to treat we don't want to kill insects because that's right, what right. they eat. Right, right, right. Okay, thank you. You so I, I spoke too soon. Yes, we can, Paul. We can use DE as Valerie said, and um, on the Virginia Bluebird Society website, which you'll see at the end. Okay, so yeah, we've got people asking um, to share their Google Sheets. If, if somebody could email an example, it can even be filled out and we'll, we'll fix it um, to uh, Joanne or me or both. Okay, a lot of people are interested in the Google Sheet. So <laughs> is there a list of plants that support the insects or cover the birds prefer? Um, oh, I thought, yeah, I had, there was a slide on that earlier. I may have zipped through that, but 
basically any kind of native plant that produces flowers, berries, seeds, um, just stick with native plants. I think you'll be okay. <laughs> it's, uh, they, they do eat berries in the winter. If you're interested in setting up a trail on HOA Common, where do you start? Oh, I just saw that one. Um, email me at uh, Loud and Wildlife. Would you include a bluebird site in Fairfax County on your monitoring program? No, I can say that because you are not in Loudoun County. Uh, Valerie, is there a separate Fairfax coordinator? There is, uh, well, the position is vacant right now. The, the uh, county coordinator recently resigned. We are working feverishly to, actually we're gonna to put together a team because Fairfax County is so huge. Yeah. But John Wilson, um, if you wanna email me, I will connect you with someone in your area in Oakton that you can work with. Um, okay. I will put my email address in the, in the uh, chat box. So if anybody wants to reach out to me, Lisa, they can. Perfect, thank you, Valerie. You're welcome. Boy, I'm glad you're here. <laughs> okay, so moving on and keep the questions coming, that's fine. We're just gonna take a break every now and then. Um, somebody was asking about the height and everything, the polls, I, I don't have all the numbers in my head, but if you go to uh, the Virginia Bluebird Society website, which will be listed at the end here, they've got all the instructions for this, how to build a box, how to install a pole, how to put the baffle on the pole, how high it should be. Um, this is a pole driver, I think it's called. I actually have one of these. If anybody needs to borrow it or borrow me and it to help, um, move or install boxes, I'm happy to help. Here we are installing the baffle. And you can see there's been a hole drilled right through the uh, middle of this, um, this pole and just attached with some things that I think are called bolts maybe. And then when, it, when the baffle goes down on top, it just rests, it just rests on those screw nut bolt things. Guess I should figure out what those are called. And then the box is installed with these little things. There's one here and there's, I uh, can't see it. There's also one at the top because if you only put one on, it's gonna swing around. And then we put a label on it and I am the official label coordinator. I will make your labels for your trail and I will laminate them with super duper good laminating that won't deteriorate after a year. Okay. So this is especially important on public trails <clears throat> when you, um, just to keep people from poking their noses in there, which they probably will anyway, but you want, you want the kind that open with the screws when you have public trails. And it also helps identify boxes for new monitors because sometimes on trails, they're not in order. It's like you have box one and then you have six and then three is over there and it's just confusing. So definitely helps. And this is just an example of a box, a complete setup with the sign away from the trees and some open areas here. And here are instructions. I'm not gonna spend time on this because this is all on, on the VBS website, uh, tells you how to how to make the baffle. And I talked about these Noel guards. Uh, we have these at, at Loudon Wildlife, lots of them. Like I said, they're flat. And this is what I was trying to say, the pointy pokey things. You want these to be pointy pokey, not cut off, not cut off smooth because you want to deter raccoons and cats and things that are trying to get in there. You wanna poke them. So, um, so yeah, we've talked about this, their habitat, food, water, location, shelter. We talked about that. Oh, here we're gonna talk about, here, here's an answer to somebody's question about, about plants, which I thought I already went over. Um, in the summertime, they eat insects, crickets, flies, katydids, beetles, worms, all kinds of stuff. They also eat caterpillars. Well, it's not on the list, but... Um, in the winter, they like berries, dogwood, cedar, holly, sumac, and other wild berries. 80% of their diet consists of insects during the spring and summer. So that's why you don't wanna use insecticides on your lawn 
because um, when you kill the flowers, you kill, or when you kill the insects, you kill their food basically. So we don't want that. Oh, here's the, I'm sorry to the person that I said, I already went over this because I didn't. <laughs> More about food. Um, here are some things you can plant. Um, just make sure that they are of the native variety. And I think these are, all of them are Eastern red cedar, flowering pagoda, dogwoods, um, not, Kusa dogwood is not native, but the, we do have some native dogwoods. Red mulberry, American holly, black cherry, crab apple, mountain ash, hawthorn, sumac, pokeweed, viburnum, Virginia creeper, and of course, more, more, more. Um, I feed the birds at my house and the bluebirds love the suet. If you get them with um, the fruit in them, they like that. If you get them with a the mealworm, they like that too. So that gives them a little supplemental food. And they'll also eat little tiny creepy crawly things like shrews and snakes and salamanders, tree frogs and lizards. Okay, the only reason I'm stopping here is I see the word Nandina in the questions. Does Nandina hurt the bluebirds? Nandina hurts everything. <laughs> please don't plant Nandina. <laughs> and if your HOA plants them in common areas, please talk to them about removing them. Um, the berries are poisonous to uh, dogs, cats, birds, and humans. So they're not good things. They're not native. Um, and burning bush the same way. Do not plant burning bush. Um, there's a website, plantnovanatives.com is gonna give you a lot of information on native plants and BJ uh, from Loudon Wildlife, actually anybody at Loudon Wildlife uh, knows a lot about um, native plants. And I would also recommend um, no affiliation, uh, Watermark Woods in Hamilton is all native plants and she will steer you in the right direction. But um, all, these, all these plants that the, the, the new developments and the HOAs are always planting, are not always good for the environment or anybody else. So there you go. Valerie just shared that's that uh, plant Nova natives. But no, uh, burning bush and Nandina are not native and they, they can actually harm, at least Nandina I know can harm the birds. I actually have a friend whose dog almost died from eating Nandina berries. So that's how bad they are. And they were just put in when her house was built. She thought they were pretty, you know, she didn't even have a say in it. She, she actually wanted to move them. And I said, no, 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 you get rid of them. And that was the day that her dog got sick. So uh, she had no idea. Most people don't. So anyway, the best way to attract all birds is to put out a bird bath. And I got bluebirds in my bird bath all the time. They're always out there. And they're really cute when the babies fledge because the parents teach them how to take a bath and it's just the cutest thing you've ever seen. So thanks to all of our volunteers and the nest boxes, the bluebirds are back. They are not endangered anymore. They are not even a species of concern. They're doing great. So we're going to connect, contribute, and learn. We have a Facebook group. Hasn't been real active over the past couple wintry covid -y months, but um, this is where you can ask a question, you can post pictures, you can toot your own horn, you can do whatever you want on here. We're all very supportive. Uh, Cialis.org is um, everything you wanna know about bluebirds. It's, it's a lot. This is gonna give you a lot of information too on what to do about house sparrows. And then uh, the VBS website, virginiabluebirds.org is also a great source for all things bluebirds. It's a little more, condensed than the Cialis. Cialis is just like, woo, it, information overload. But Virginia Bluebird Society is a very good website. So how do you sign up? How do you sign up? First of all, if you have already signed up to be a volunteer, if you are a volunteer, please don't sign up again because we already have your information. You got an email from um, Kim in January, I think. Um, asking you, are you coming back? Are you still going to be a leader? Are you still going to be a monitor? And she has not heard back from a lot of people. So if you got that email, um, please let Kim know I'm coming back. I'm not coming back. That's, you know, 
that's what we need to know. Uh, because we have a lot of trails to fill with volunteers and we're just going to assume you're coming back. <laughs> so um, go to loudandwildlife.org and then click on volunteer and then volunteer application. Okay, so this is kind of important. When you fill out the form, you're going to fill out all your contact information. And in the space where it says other skills or why do you want to volunteer? you don't have to put that information in there. We want you to put in an area where you would like to volunteer. For instance, Sterling, Leesburg, Percival. If you don't wanna be specific, if you're flexible, <laughs> you willing to go anywhere, say you'll go anywhere. You only wanna do something in Western Loudoun, just put Western Loudoun. It just helps us know like, cause we, we tend to have a lot of openings like in the very far stretches of the county and some people, want to stick for whatever reason to, to more centralized areas. So if you're willing to go to Lovettsville to monitor or to the Blue Ridge Center out um, almost to West Virginia, <laughs> um, let us know so that we can place you in, in the area that, that makes the most sense. And if, if you're not picky and you have a couple of areas you're willing to help, just list those so that, um, so that we know where to put you. And just please know that there, not every single trail needs a volunteer. So if you say, I want to volunteer at um, Tuscarora High School trail, uh, um, and I'm just using them as an example, there may not be a need for volunteers there. So we, we would want you to hopefully go somewhere else. So um, anyway, here's my note. I said, if you already volunteer, don't sign up again on the website, okay? And here is actually a picture of the website, what it looks like. So one more thing, when you do any Bluebird monitoring work, just take a few seconds to enter your volunteer hours at the Loudoun Wildlife website. You're gonna click on uh, loudonwildlife.org and then volunteer. And then there's a drop down menu where volunteer hours. It's the same place you're gonna find the volunteer application. It's right under that volunteer hours. Uh, Loudon Wildlife uses this information to demonstrate community support when applying for grants. And in some cases, we can convert volunteer time into dollars for matching grants. So it's very, very important. If you spend an hour, if you're going to give a presentation to your HOA, you spend an hour um, dis uh, dissecting my PowerPoint. I'm happy to send it to you, but you want to make it shorter. Um, you put that hour down, just put your hour in there. If you spend two hours given the presentation, put your two hours in there. Uh, when you go out to monitor, put your time in there. It takes, my trail takes an hour. So I've got an hour to put in every day, every time I monitor. So thank you for attending and we hope you sign up. And I'm gonna look at, does putting volunteer hours into VMN system count for LWC too? For those of you who don't know, VMN is Virginia Master Naturalist, and they are two separate organizations and they are two separate systems. So you would need to put your hours in both places. Does that answer your question, Bruce? I hope. Let's see. Yes.org. VJ says yes.org. Yeah, burning bush. Oh, BJ's BJ's chiming in with the with the natives. <laughs> Good. People are adding things to the list. White oak. Uh, I do not have a contact in Maryland. Valerie may be able to help you. Baltimore City. You've never seen a bluebird. Yeah, they're not really city birds. You've probably seen a lot of house sparrows though. Blueberry bushes. Yep, they're great. Oh, okay, that's why. <laughs> yes, org. Okay, I got gotcha. you. Plant note of natives is org. Okay, any more questions? That's it. Lisa, you have done a fabulous job. <gasps> well, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> so much. And actually, I took some notes of things that I want to ask you how you did. Okay. Because I did learn from you today. Okay, good. So, wow, I'm yeah. so flattered. <laughs> no, you did a fabulous job and, and bravo for Loudoun Conservancy. Good for you all. Thank you.
we're working. We're working at it. Thank you guys. Thanks everyone for attending. If, oh, my email, yeah, it's it's my first initial L, my last name McHugh, M-C-K-E-W at loudandwildlife.org. And um, maybe when, when BJ sends out the link to the recording. I was going to say, I've kept a list of some of the things that um, people have been asking for. Okay. So we can send a follow-up email to everyone that has all of these links and these various things that people have been asking for. Okay. Perfect. All right. Looks like people are. Okay. Bye everybody. Bye Lisa. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Bye. 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 Great job. Thank, Thank you. you, Lisa. And actually it is 326. Look at that. Perfect. Right on schedule.